Hello, everyone. Happy Friday. Uh, thanks for joining us. And uh, thanks for joining us a little bit later than usual. As I said in the post, and hopefully people saw that we're, uh, we delayed the start a bit because uh, England is playing Scotland as we speak, which the, the match has not ended yet. Um, so maybe we'll, we'll keep you updated as we go along. Um, but uh, I'd like to get onto our conversation right away. So, you know, today I'm really excited because, uh, you know, there's been a lot of, we had a lot of great guests on this show of ours uh, over the past few months. And most of them are people that I've actually met before. But uh, today we have two guests who I've not actually met in person before, but only know them through their whiskey, which is a great way, I think, to meet a lot of people. So without further ado, I'm going to welcome, and I hope you will as well, Alex Bruce and Connell McKenzie. Hello, guys. Hello. Thanks for joining. Right. Good evening. <laughs> um, I, I realize that uh, we're going to have a distracted audience, both you guys and the, a lot of the people that will probably tune in, but it's totally understandable. <laughs> no, yeah, I must admit there is one eye on, 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 on another screen, but uh, I will, my, my, my focus is 100% um, with yourself, Greg. <laughs> If you just start screaming out obscenities <laughs> or joy, we'll understand why. Okay, uh, please, please. There may be that, so please, just uh, please uh, don't judge me on it. Um, could you guys possibly uh, introduce yourselves? Because uh, I think you'll do a better job than I will, even though I have it written here. But I'd, I'd love to hear what you have to say about yourselves, if you wouldn't mind. Sure. Age before, uh, age, before, age, be, age before beauty. Yeah, yeah. You can stop there. <laughs> age before. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, yes, so um, thank you very much for having us, Greg. Um, I'm Alex Bruce. Uh, I'm the managing director of Adelphi and the Ardner Merkin Distillery. Um, I joined Adelphi back in 2004 when the company changed ownership. And uh, just it was really just me and one other back then. And we gradually built the team and, uh, and uh, built a distillery as well. So we now have um, 28 in the team we have our own bottling warehouse uh, offices down here in fife which is where we farm and then up in ardemerkin we have a seven-year-old distillery um so that that's kind of me in a nutshell um connell joined us what three three years ago three years ago, now? <laughs> three years, ago. Three, three years ago pro pretty much to the day actually yeah so yeah. Yeah, I, I joined three years ago. I'm, I'm sorry, my name is Connell McKenzie. I am the sales director for Adelphi and Arden American Distillery. And yeah, as Alex has said, nearly three years to the day I've been I've, 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 I've been here. So it's, it's been a wonderful experience. And I moved back to Scotland uh, from New Zealand uh, three years ago. So I, I, I first got into the, the, the industry in New Zealand over uh, in Christchurch in a, in a, in a retail uh, capacity and an importing capacity um, with Whiskey Galore, a uh, well-known uh, retailer whiskey specialist out there, and came back three years ago to, to join Adelphi. So yeah, it's been great. Um, we're, we, you know, uh, we're actually uh, hopefully going to do something in New Zealand um, with Whiskey Galore. Uh, oh, very cool. In the next couple of months. I know we have a, we have a couple of people on our team do are specializing in different things and one of our producers is setting up like overseas events and things, some of which are virtual, hopefully event, some of which will eventually be in person. Um, but I'm hope, I'll go to that one. I've not been to New Zealand before, so. Oh, it's fantastic. <laughs> the whole, the, and all the people behind uh, Whiskey Galore are just wonderful people. And yeah, you'll have, you'll have a great time. So make sure you uh, you pick yourself in to go to that one. Well, I'm pretty selfish about choosing the places <laughs> I want to go. Uh, like I'm, yeah. I hop to the front of the queue when there's oh I haven't been there I think we I really want to go to Norway so we're that's on that's on my short list so um well okay so the, you know uh, one of the things I really wanted to talk to about is a few months ago uh, I guess this is a question for you Alex but either one of you can certainly answer it I was in a tasting um, I believe it was actually a signatory tasting online and someone asked do you think that independent bottlers have a signature house style is is that conceivable is it possible uh, d does one emerge over time? And I immediately thought of you guys because, to, in my opinion, and you might certainly disagree with me. I, like I, I th I've, I've had, I've had a Delphi whiskey, but not a ton because it's not, I, I, it's not easy to get here. Um, you know, but, uh, but to me, the the house style, if there is one, was just one of quality more than a flavor profile. You know, it was sort of a, a very select choice. Yeah, well, it's very kind of you to say. Um, I suppose it really comes. It, it, it comes from the historical passion for whiskey. 
uh, for Scotch whiskey. And my predecessor, Jamie Walker, who was the great grandson of Archibald Walker, who owned the original Loch Catrin Adelphi distillery in Glasgow. Jamie got into the, the whole independent bottling back in 1992, purely because he loved whiskey. Um, now, today, there are hundreds of independent bottlers around the world. In 1992, there were maybe five or six mainstream ones, and that was it. Um, and so he felt, you know, the best way to share his passion was to very carefully select single casks with the help of uh, Charlie McLean um, and purely based on what they enjoyed themselves. And that, so that kind of self-passion, if you like, in what whiskies they enjoyed spilled out into the, into the actual Delphi brand. And we've never changed it. I mean, Connell, myself, our whole team, we all love whiskey and, and we will never bottle anything that we don't enjoy drinking ourselves. So it, it's a very simple philosophy, but it, it's the easiest way for us to do it. You, you know, it's it's funny. Just the other day, someone asked me about what made me choose the distilleries I chose to feature throughout the film. And, and it dawned on me, I, I, I it was true all along. I just had never put it into words before that it's clearly reflective of my taste. It's whiskeys that I was either personally a fan of or was a fan of the way they were being made. Um, you know, the, I, I thought there was a, a unique handcrafted quality or a tradition or some sort of approach that so it, it the film actually in essence became reflective of my taste so yeah. uh, it's it, i think a similar experience like to what you're saying about jamie walker it was sort of that is the style is, is that of someone's personal taste it just kind of writ yeah. large and it, you know, I mean, just to, to just to finish on 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 his thing i mean it was the story goes that the first cask or the first cask they bought jamie only had enough money to buy two i think um, and uh, he had something like three or four spring banks and hard bag and everything else lined up, and he ended up only being able to buy two, and he picked the very two best that they liked. Um, but it, it, yeah, it's it's all about personal uh, flavor, you know, impression, and really just being able to get behind it, and not necessarily because of the age or because of the distillery, uh, just about flavor. So uh, let me ask you a question and then, how does that go into when you're creating a distillery, then you literally have to create a sort of house style, you know? Um, was that a, was was that reflective of your taste? Was there a panel? Was there, was, you know, um, how did you guys come upon the, the sort of Arden American style? <laughs> I mean, if I answer the first half of that, and then I'll let Connell answer the second half because he was involved uh, in the second half. Um, the first half, look, we, we built this, um, we decided to build this distillery in one of the most remote locations in Scotland. It's not an island, but it, it could easily be. You, you pretty much have to get a ferry to get there. It's single track road for an hour, um, but there are no other distilleries. It's it's unique, Ardemarkin distillery on Ardemarkin. So the idea, the concept of building one there was to let it fit in naturally and not try and force anything. So we didn't go for any strange kind of um, uh, wood makeup, you know, we didn't buy different casks. We just kept to the traditional ex bourbon ex sherry. Um, we used the, the the water from the hill. We matured on site, or we mature on site, so everything was as natural as possible. Um, and that that was the foundation. And then, if you fast forward, uh, what six years to um, about this time last year, Connell and I had locked ourselves in the warehouses for a week to start putting together um, the first single malt. And, and and that's kind of where you kicked in. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's one of these things, you know, I, I've followed Arden American since I was I was trying to sell, well, not trying to sell, very um, selling Adelphi in Christchurch in New Zealand. And the, the sort of whole journey I've followed from, from, you know, importing it to selling it, to being a fan of it, and then joining the company. And, you know, I can, I can. I'm delighted to tell you that you know having the the different styles of peated and unpeated. You know we do six months of each, so we've got a real breadth of of, of flavour there that we're filling into. We were we are fairly traditional. We're starting to mix things up a wee bit now, but we you know predominantly we've been very traditional and filling ex bourbon barrels and ex sherry casks, both PX and Oloroso, for the last six seven years. You know that's that's what we've been doing with eleven thousand casks now lying in the warehouse. So when we opened the doors, 
last year to just go and try and put something together. We, we knew we knew the liquid was was really good, um, but the style, as you as as as, as you asked, w- what was the style going to be? And we we pretty much picked out fifty percent peated, fifty percent unpeated, and maybe a, I think it was about a sixty. The first batch was maybe sixty five. 65-35 split of, of ex bourbon barrels to ex sherry, so it was it was pretty much what 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 we do in in, in an annual year uh, in an annual yeah, and it was yeah we didn't actually set out to do that, um, which was really spooky. But you know we put we put three styles together, three potential single malts, and and put them in front of people that we that we know we trust and who we work with, the production team, our team down at uh, Bottling Hall and Fife. Um, Mr. Charles McLean, Mr. Dave Broom, and thankfully we all came to the same conclusion, and that is now what we have we have tried to stick to, and I think managed to pretty pretty much um, now for what are we in four batches? Well, that's great. Uh, you answered a couple of my next questions. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> no, that's great uh, because it, it's funny. I know that I, I've I've listened to you. Um, be interviewed in various places and just you know done some research and and I know that your bottling halls in Fife correct and it it, it it occurred to me at the time well they must have wanted to make a West Coast style whiskey because it certainly would have been easier to build a distillery in Fife than in Arden American. I've got, I've got a wee story about that actually which not many people know about. Um, so bearing in mind the original distillery was called the Loch Katrin Adelphi Distillery. And since 2010, we've had this building in Fife on my own family's farm. So the land was, was available. And we grow the barley here for the distillery um, in Arden Merkin. Um, after we'd finished building the Arden Merkin distillery, I was driving down to the warehouse, to the offices one morning. And there were a whole bunch of people in, in the field, just next to the road, wearing high-vis vests, you know, big yellow vests, um, digging this hole. And I asked my brother, what, what's going on? And he said, oh, the Loch Katrin pipe has sprung a leak. And I said, which pipe? He said, the Loch Katrin pipe has sprung a leak. Now, Loch Katrin is about 100 miles west of us, um, above Glasgow. But I didn't realize way back in the Victorian times when they built steamships here in our dockyard in Resyth, just next to us here, they only wanted Loch Katrin water. It had to be the purest water for the steamships when they were building it. So they put this massive Victorian pipe all the way across Scotland, and oh, it runs right past our warehouse, literally. About <laughs> 10 foot across it. So we could have, if we'd wanted to, recreated the Loch Katrin distillery. Um, <laughs> but, but no, I mean, uh, we love West Coast style. Uh, the whole team loves it. The whole ethos of our American is about the West Coast, and, it, and it, it's something that we've tried so hard to, to bottle. Well, I, you know, I've, I've had one dram of Arden American. I was, I visited Sam, I visited Impex last month and, and he gave me dram and I, and I was quite taken by it. Um, and, uh, and I really, I'm a, I really like, there's a, uh, the, that sort of waxy. I, I've, al- I've always been a fan of whis- whis- whiskey's waxy. That's hard to say. <laughs> <laughs> whiskey's that have that waxy component to the spirit, you know, and I, I, I picked up on that immediately and, and really responded to it. And that's when I, that's when I thought, well, maybe they, you know, it's really wanted that sort of style. And that's, I guess that's where I was originally going with my question, but I said, like you guys kind of answered it was what came first, the the location or the style, you know? Um, but I think you pretty well answered that. Yeah, hand in hand, I think. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I think, I think just, just on that, you know, when you, when you mentioned waxiness, um, yeah, it is there. There's, there's no doubt about it. And, and, and that's, that, you know that usually leans towards a very well-known distillery just north of where I am, um, just north of Inverness in a wee town called Brora. Uh, there's a very waxy um, whiskey there, and you know it's, it, we have been compared to young styles of it, and that's you know one of the biggest compliments you can actually ever have, in my opinion, because it's it is my desert island dram. But you know, like the, the it's a texture for me uh, on on the on the spirit, you know that we're, that we're managing to achieve. Um, and that 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 saline quality, it really does take you to the west coast. Really takes you down to that beachfront. So yeah, no, we're, we're really happy with it, and I, I cannot wait to watch it grow. Well, I, I saw that our friend Derek Mather said he just ordered a cask of our Demarcan for artisan two weeks ago. So, oh, um, hi Derek, hi Derek. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
And uh, yeah, so here, Donner Pass Whiskey said uh, that, that they've had samples of Adelphi. And um, uh, yeah, as have I. And they are great. And, you know, I think that's a testament to your rigor um, as far as style and wood and all of that. So um, I know we, going back to the beginning, though, we, we all love it, uh, what we're doing. And I mean, just to, to put it into context, when we're blending these batches, we all get together. It's a team effort. And um, that way we can ensure that it's it's the right thing going into the bottle. Um, and, it, it, you know, it's just it's just that passion comes through. Well, do you know, um, uh, I was uh, when we first started shooting the film, we didn't we shot the film in November. Most of the film was shot in November and of 2018 and January of 2019. But we did a preliminary little sort of a mini shoot, if you will, in June of 2018. We just three of us just kind of went around Scotland for eight days and visited some distilleries. And that's I spent a bunch of time at Gordon McPhail. Then. And, um, and, and that was the last day of that trip we spent with Charlie. And and he said to me at the time, not on camera, just chatting. He said and we were talking about all the new distilleries that have popped up. And he said, um, keep your eye on Arden Merkin. He said uh, they're going to they're going to, you know, wake the world up in a lot of ways. I don't remember the term he used. It was a, a great <laughs> Charlie term, I'm sure that. <laughs> uh, but, um, but you know, he was he told me he might keep my eye on it then. Uh, I'll remember to, rem remember to pay him later. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's it's funny. He, uh, I made a list. We have a producer in Falkirk there on our team, um, Leslie Ann, and she and I made a list of all the distilleries I wanted to go to. And our Demerkin was immediately that day put on the list. And then when it came down to planning our shoot, she came to me and said, you have a choice. She said, I see, I see that you want to go to Springbank and I see that you want to go to Arden Merkin. You can only do one. You, you have to do one. And so we both agreed. We're like, well, Arden Merkin's whiskey is not ready yet. So let's go to Springbank. But I've always, I've always hated the fact that I didn't <laughs> now more than ever, but I will. I promise when I can, uh, <laughs> hopefully this year. Yeah, um, absolutely. We make you more than welcome. And, you know, I'm not going to hold it against you that you, you chose Springbank regardless. Cause you know, let's be honest. Uh, it's one of those, um, I uh, just the bucket list whiskey for well certainly for me and for a lot of whiskey people and I know Alex as well and um, we're both massive fans of the tune and actually all the people down there as well so they're they're a great great bunch well I actually had a very good lifelong friend um he's actually a friend of mine's father who was from Campbellton and um when I was an ex his son was an exchange student to the U.S. and that's how we met and then I was an exchange student to Scotland later and whenever I would be in the UK, he would always have me come visit him. He was a, a doctor uh, on the Wirral outside of Liverpool, mm -hmm. and but he was from Campbellton. And so he always, he was so excited when we were making this film and he was, and he, without me even asking, set me up with like 10 things I needed to do in Campbellton <laughs> beyond the distillery. And then, you know, unfortunately while we were finishing the film, he passed away. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, it was, I was always glad that I went there because it made him so happy and he was always such a, a great guy and so good to me. But, um, uh, so, you know, one of the things that I heard you talk about, Alex, in I think it was One Nation Under Whiskey. I've, I've, like I said, I've listened to you on a number of podcasts, but you were talking about the history of illicit distilling um, around the Arden Market Peninsula and stuff. And uh, I was really immediately, I'm looking for, I don't know where it is. I thought I had it here. But anyway, I have Charlie's book, uh, Scotland's Secret History, about the history of illicit dis distilleries and smuggling and all that. And, you know, I'm, I'm actually kind of working with a writer friend of mine on, on possibly trying to make a documentary about the history of different different historical milestones in whiskey. And I've become very interested in that, especially because I think it has, uh, I, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm stealing this a little bit from Dave Broom, where the people romanticize it as if it was something sweet and romantic, but it was, you know, really this pretty arduous necessity of a time. And so I, but I had never in anything I'd ever read, heard some of the stuff you talked about, about people, you know, smugglers having a, a small scale sea battles with the excise men and sinking a boat off the. <laughs> <laughs> um, this, this actually came up. Um, it, of all people, it was our designers. So they, when we came up with the concept of the distillery, it wasn't just building the, um, uh, the actual plant, you know, to make whiskey. It was also thinking about how we would welcome visitors because unless you knew Arden American, it, it wasn't that well visited. You know, it's quite a secret place and it's, it is stunning. I mean, it's beautiful, white sandy beaches, um, absolutely beautiful. But they said, look, let's do a bit of research on distilling in the area. And then, you know, you could have historical records in the visitor center when you welcome people. And one of the things they found 
um, there were two things I found. One was um, that the Isle of Mull, so Tobermory, uh, which we know is a distillery, which is about 12 miles as the crow flies from us. So you can get there in 20 minutes in a fast boat um, and it takes about two hours by road. But um, back in the day of illicit distilling on Arden and Merkin, the story goes that they had taken by rowing boat, they'd taken some whiskey or spirit to sell in Tobermory. And as they came in to the harbour, um, the customs or the excise officers were waiting. They'd been tipped off. So they got into their kind of faster sailing boat and chased them back towards our Demerkin. But the cunning our Demerkin folk managed to sink their, the, the excise boat and pegged it back to, um, to our Demerkin and disappeared into the woods, never to be seen again. So, yeah, it, it, there were lots of these little stories that, that cropped up. But the other one, which was when we were researching if there'd been an official distillery, this came from the late, great, sadly, very recently late, great um, 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 Colin at, at Ben Nevis. And he said there's a historical record in the courts in Fort William of a farmer suing a distiller on Arden American for basically um, uh, making his chickens drunk. <laughs> and I think and we're not quite sure what had happened, but somehow alcohol had got into the draft. Um, you know, into the, into the dry grains. Um, and it was about to be thrown out of court when the judge asked for any final witnesses. And at that point, the, the great wooden doors of the courtroom were flung open and the farmer's wife, who was built you know, quite sturdily, um, stormed into the room with two chickens under her arms and went right up to the judge, up to the bench and put them down on the um, bench. And they both went and then fell over on their side. <laughs> and, and, he, he decided that was enough evidence and found in the favor of the farmer. <laughs> but, yeah. You know, there's a, I think it was at Bob Blair. They told us a story about the, the drunken cows. You know that? It some uh, it's probably of, a very uh, similar reason, but I hadn't heard it. No. Well, it was, I, I think it was during the Second World War and a, a wayward bomb hit a warehouse and basically created a flood of whiskey pouring down the road, but it went past the cow pasture and the cows drank it. And then there was a cow sort of, stampede of drunken cows through the village. And there's a photo of it. They showed us the newspaper clipping and there was this photo of these sort of policemen Brilliant. keeping a safe distance from these cows. They don't look like, I mean, let's face it, cows don't really run very much, you know, but they <laughs> <laughs> they might walk with intent. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so there's, you know, the has there ever been a distillery on the Arden American Peninsula before? I mean, I know you said about the the other distillery with the name was not in our market, right? Correct. So no, I mean Scotland was littered with distilleries um, in, in days gone. Um, some of, the, I mean, to be honest, most of these were before tax. But even after the, the whole tax regime came in, I mean, if I speak for ourselves here on the farm, I mean, I've, my family's been here for best part of five hundred years, and um, we have records of having to collect um, um, duty, if you like, on behalf of the government. As a, as a landowner, you had to go around. And we had, I think, three or four distilleries just on this little estate here in Fife. Um, so, yeah, Aldermerkin definitely had plenty of distilleries. But since the, the sort of proper kind of legalized, if you like, days, uh, there hasn't been um, a recorded one. Hmm. So one of the things that I told when I, I said Leslie Ann and I made this list of distilleries that I found interesting or, at, or, or inspiring, and one of the things that she and I always used as kind of a touchstone term that we used was I always interested in distilleries that have one foot planted in the past and another foot striding forward into into the new, but doing the new in a grounded way, you know, not just experimenting for the sake of experimenting or not just change for the sake of change, but there's a, a respect for tradition as a stepping off point. Um, somewhere there's a great analogy about architectural, modern architectural buildings still have to have the same foundation that an old barn has to have. You know, there's a, the foundation yeah. is important. And one of the things I think for, is interesting about you guys is you check me if I'm wrong here, but you guys are the most ecologically forward distillery probably in Scotland. Right. Um, and that, that to me immediately is very interesting. Uh, Connell, do you want to pick this one up or do you want to say? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I mean, we, where we are um, in Scotland, I mean, we, we've already alluded to that we're not officially an island, but, you know, we may as well be, you know, Tesco's don't deliver 
to the peninsula, but they 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 deliver to other parts of Scotland, where you know it's um, I think it was it was it was the the vision of of Alex and the team um, back in twenty, well when the idea was brought to two thousand eight give or take, and then the planning that if they were going to put something on the peninsula, they needed to to be as eco friendly as green as they could be, and. And I think that's just a responsibility and maybe a luxury that we have when, when you build a new distillery that, you know, maybe that should be on your mind um, if, you, if, if it can be. I think, you know, the whiskey industry has been going for so long, it's obviously quite hard for distilleries who have been making their whiskey for so long to, to implement that, you know, because they've had bricks there since the 1800s. But I think as a new build, you know, yeah, I think we should be taking these measures, and we have. We've, 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 we've got a. We're 100 percent fueled by biomass, so we, 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 the whole, the whole plant is run on 100 percent, 100 percent run on wood chip, which is from a local forestry about two miles down the road. You know, Huey, Huey uh, brings it in, in, in by tractor and trailer uh, twice a day, and uh, we've got a small hydro um, on on the river next door for our cooling water and we just we really have tried um, and i think succeeded just to make things just a little bit more friendlier towards our environment and it's a responsibility that we we really do take seriously um another small example before i'll, I'll let alex just chime in here but you know we when when we launched our whiskey last year we we decided that we weren't going to get away with not producing a carton for it now um it's been quite heated over here in the UK, our carton, and uh, it's, it's made of 100% waste recycled uh, cardboard, which is the first, I believe, and please correct me someone if, if, if I am wrong, but we believe it's the first um, product or whiskey, certainly, that has got 100% uh, recycled. Um, basically, the inside of a loo roll uh, is what we're using and trying to dress it up a wee bit so it looks presentable. We just feel that, you know, it's all about the liquid. And yes, OK, it needs to be a good looking bottle and a good looking package. And we understand that. But we want to be as, as uh, you know, we need to be eco friendly as we can in, in, in every approach, not just some. So, yeah, Alex, do you want to chime in on that? Yeah, I mean, just really to add um, purely about the, the, the location it's a kind of symbiosis um it's a circular economy which we're trying to maintain or, or create and maintain in a very remote place so if you were to take Arden American and, and dump it on its own in the middle of the Atlantic which it kind of is um you would would want it to survive on its own so the fact that there was forestry and wood chipping on site um the fact that we had a good but small but very talented local workforce um, all of these things play into to helping each other. Um, so yes, we take the wood chip by tractor and trailer. The same tractor and trailer takes away our draft. We we put our liquid byproducts across to the same plant, and it gets made up and mixed up into animal feed to feed the cows on the peninsula, and and that benefits the farm as well. So everyone is scratching everyone's back um, as a single entity, if you like, even though we're different companies. Are you guys familiar with um, Dan Barber? The, the third plate. Yes. Uh, yes, 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 absolutely. Yeah. So I'm, I'm reading that right now. And I was listening to him being interviewed the other day and he talked about uh, a Vietnamese rice patty and that it, he was talking about the, the sort of the dangers of forgetting traditions. And that basically hundreds of years ago, they had discovered that if they let the rice grow taller than a duck, it had to be taller than a duck, then you could introduce ducks then the ducks would eat the weeds that were shorter than the rice, but they wouldn't eat the rice because the rice was bigger than they were. Then at the end of the season, you could harvest the ducks and the rice and yeah. not have to use any sort of pesticides or anything. Yeah. Um, and it was just, I just, I love those little moments that, that people sort of forget that, that there is a wisdom and a simplicity to things the way people have done them. And we forget them at our peril, I think. No, I mean, another great advocate of that, a good friend of mine, an old friend of mine called Hamish Martin, who actually Sam, Funny enough, is just about to import his gin. Uh, he's based outside Edinburgh, uh, the Secret Garden. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah. And he, he's all about letting the weeds grow. The local weeds grow, the bees feed off them, the honey is as pure as, you know, and if you eat the honey and you live in Edinburgh, you don't get ill um, because it's all about uh, preserving the local habitat and, and everyone, everything does its bit. Um, yeah. It's fantastic. 
the I'm I'm originally from Pennsylvania and I'm from the part of Pennsylvania where the Amish live. And you know, the Amish by never having changed anything have sort of become kind of trendy in the foodie world because they sort right. of never used pesticides or never used, you know, any of the different sort of um, more modern innovations that have now sort of been questioned. And I and I'm always inspired by just, you know, distilleries or any any people that kind of look like I said, look to the past as a way of kind of creating a better future. And and I, I really think you guys have done that. And and all the things I've heard about, it, you know, certainly talks about that in, in relation to you guys. Uh, great. Um, I think that it's funny because speaking of that, I, I there's so many new distilleries in Scotland over the last what decade, you know, um, and that one of the ones I always would hear about in the in the lead up to their whiskey maturing was was you guys there's you know there's a handful I, I mean i think i probably have heard at least a little of all of them but there's some that you hear about more than others and I, I was wondering if you guys could talk to me a little bit about that the challenges of doing that uh in that sort of now crowded marketplace um where you're not able to i mean maybe i'm wrong i don't think you guys you guys are not selling to blenders correct um <laughs> You may okay. Not 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 directly to blenders. Um, we are doing a few fillings. Um, coming from an independent bottling background, if you like, we are very pro independent bottling. And you know, there's that old question of, about whether independent bottlers are um, uh, helping the industry or are they a parasite to the industry. I've always been very much uh, of the belief that they help because they do things that larger distillers can't um, in terms of cast selection, whiskey styles, um, um, you know, getting into places large companies can't. Anyway, um, in terms of, of um, how we're dealing with the crowded market, it's a very interesting concept. Um, and I think uh, the whole COVID, the whole pandemic has, has made it even more, uh, I wouldn't say complicated, but it's changed the directions in so many different ways because we've basically been sat at home for over a year doing what we're doing tonight. Um, we, we can't get on planes. We can't go and wave our whiskey under people's noses like we used to. Um, however, having said all that, if we backtrack to, 90, uh, so to 2004, when I started, the first thing I did was got on a plane with the Delphi. I only had 200 bottles. That's all I had to sell. But I got on a plane and I started to build the markets around the world in a traditional way. So we now have, what, 26, 27 markets uh, we're in. Yeah. Um, and 99% of those markets were as thirsty as you could possibly be for more volume uh, and for a new whiskey. So it was quite easy for us to turn on the, the distribution tap with Arden American. Some of the other new distilleries didn't have that luxury because they've quite rightly come to the game very recently. They've seen you know, how well Scotch whiskey is doing and they wanted to join in. Um, so they've had to look at more modern methods and these modern methods go around e-commerce, things like that, which works in some markets, but doesn't work in others because you have legal aspects which prevent it. Um, um, so it, it's, a, it's going to be interesting to see how things pan out um, in the next few years. Um, there's definitely some really interesting uh, new whiskies coming out. Um, and uh, I think it's a great thing for the industry. I think the, the, the consumer at the other end will have so much more choice than they've ever had of decent quality single malt. Well, so, you know, I was going to ask you next about the pandemic and, you know, about how you, that had to be doubly challenging. I, I can speak from my personal experience. It was really hard. We had a film ready to go. We were supposed to <laughs> debut the film at the Feshiel, not last month, but last year. And, you know, so we, this certainly wasn't what we anticipated and we kind of had to reinvent as we went along. Um, and I imagine you, you guys, I mean, your, your first whiskey came out in September. Is that right? Yeah, so the the our our first single malt came out end of September, yeah, beginning of October, and I to be to be quite frank with you, we Alex and I were both um, in New Zealand and Australia, and on, on a work trip, taking in Dram Fest, which is a festival out there, and then we did a wee sort of um, tasting tour of Australia, and it got pulled uh, last, but it got pulled overnight. Basically, we had to get home. Things were getting pretty ugly in the UK. So we decided, right? Let's let's just let's just get ourselves home. So I just we, we got off that plane and I drove up the A9. I'm I'm just outside Inverness in the Highlands, and uh, Alex went to Fife, and 
that was it. Lockdown happened, and I remember the I remember the the meeting, the team meeting that we had. It was basically, do we go ahead as planned? Do we launch this whiskey or do we not? And the, it was a overwhelming um, yes. We're going to go for it. You know, we 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 know that our whiskey's ready. We've waited slightly longer than the most. You know, we we wanted to wait until we felt it was truly ready, and we we're coming into our sixth year, and we we were. We were itchy. We were we we wanted to release it, and so yes, it, to answer your question, it was extremely challenging. Um, not just the liquid part of it, putting it together, finding a style, but everything from label design, glass, corks, capsules, packaging, everything was was to do it in normal times is challenging, but to do it in in those times was 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 quite a feat, I think, and 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 you know something that. You know, Alex, myself, and the whole team worked tirelessly, tirelessly to do, um, but we, we got there and we managed to get out in time. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, I imagine, I imagine one thing that would probably be easier, because uh, it certainly is true for me, is that Alex can now be in Tokyo in the morning and London in the evening and Berlin tomorrow, and you know that you can sort of. I, I we're we're about to do a bunch of things in Japan and Taiwan, but the truth is, I'm going to be in the same chair I'm in right now. You know, <laughs> so. yeah. So, Greg, I I um when we built the team, and most recently we've been building the sales and marketing team because we've actually now got something to talk about, um, uh, rather than just always selling out of Adelphi. Um, but when we built the sales and marketing team, the relief on my face was was um, fairly obvious, as I realized I didn't have to jump on a plane every second week as I had been. Um, the problem with with um, um, online tastings and events now is that I don't I now don't get to cherry pick whether I go to New Zealand or America or whatever. I just have to because <laughs> it, <laughs> it's the same for everyone. But no, to be fair, I mean Connell, Graham, Jenny, Antonium, you know, they're they're all doing their own markets and it's great. You, you can be as a small company, you can be so many more places using the virtual world than you could uh, in the traditional way. What, what I would say just further to that, Alex, is that, you know, w when we we did, I think it's probably our smartest decision when, when we launched our whiskey is we developed a tasting pack. So mm. it, it basically included uh, a four or five CLs, one including the single malt, and then three different cask samples. So we basically used a single cask, um, made three and a, just over three and a half thousand packs and sent them across the world. So we actually virtually launched in every market that we're in. So regardless if it was New Zealand, Australia, uh, Japan, Taiwan, you know, Hungary, it didn't matter. We, we did a tasting for for every market. So it was a really good way of actually saying, hey, there's our single malt. Yes, I hope you enjoy that. But here's three other things that, you know, that we're currently experimenting with. So, yeah, we still managed to get our, our whiskey in front of many people, which was which was great. So what's what's next? What what specifically? What what's next in general? But specifically, I know you're about to very soon, right? About to launch here. And uh, so, what what can people expect? <laughs> um, well, yeah, according according to the emails today, we're I think we're landing next week. It's it's, um, it's, it's very very soon. Yeah, and then there's a couple of weeks of you know warehouse uh, bringing to the warehouse and stuff. So it's it's very imminent. Um, I can't wait. Um, I mean, just personally, I've got a lot of friends in the US uh, who have been asking for American for years. And I said, well, there's nothing we can do. Um, in, in fairness, we we had um, Adelphi used to be very big in the US compared to the size of the company. It used to be our number one market. But we're talking um, from sort of early 2000s through to about 2012. Um, our importer then retired. We moved importer, um, and again we built different markets, different different um, states. But things changed, and it's taken us a few years to unravel and and get back with um, uh, Sam, who we, we think is doing an amazing job for the other brands he's working with, and his team with Joshua and everyone. Um, so we honestly cannot wait to to hit the shore, uh, hit the ground running. Um, uh, and it's very exciting. And the first batch, it's about what five thousand bottles coming in. Yep, just just five thousand, nearly on the nose. And um, a wee a wee single cask, which I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say or not, but I just have. And uh, yeah, look, it's we're, we're really excited. And you know, we're also really excited to um, 
to we're developing an Adelphi list and 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 yeah, there's 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 lots of things going on and um I just can't wait to for it to to land and actually go on sale and 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 receive some feedback from everyone because as Alex said, you know, I've got a lot of friends in the US as well. And, you know, a lot of, we, we get, I, not daily, but certainly a, a good couple of inquiries every week saying, you know, come on, guys, we're seeing it everywhere else. When's it, when's it going to land? Um, so it's, 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 it's going to be there very, very soon. And I imagine the two recent legal things have helped, right? Yeah. The, the 700 mil bottle. <laughs> the, the, uh, the yeah. timing, I mean, you could potentially say that we had something to do with that, but the timing was perfect. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> the tailwind. Um, uh, <laughs> well, I mean, I know. I mean, I certainly am one, and I surround myself with loads of whiskey nerds. And I know people. People are, you know, they, they've been talking about it for quite some time. And uh, and one of the things that is interesting. I mean, it, you kind of touched on this a little earlier, Alex. That's, I think, probably a testament to the heritage of Adelphi, is that. You you guys didn't feel the need to release your first whiskey when it was three years old, and the you know, the next Monday it's on the shelves. It's you 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 let it. You were comfortable enough to let it wait until you felt it was ready. I, I assume yes. Yeah, I mean, I I had a number of. I'll be very honest. I didn't at that sort of middle period. So you have your your um, early years of production, which are fantastic. Everyone's just really excited about making whiskey for the first time, and then you go into that sort of slightly anxious time when there's a lot of money going out and nothing coming in um and it was anxious i mean everyone's been through it um but i was adamant that it wasn't just about the quality being ready because we got some pretty good quality early on um we one of the things we did do is we filled some smaller casks um not necessary to bottle but to see to get an accelerated maturation just to see how the style was coming on uh very early doors so that allowed us just to um, uh, have a better idea of where we were going to be in terms of time. But the most important thing for me was that if we were going to launch, we should do it when we had enough backup stock. So it was all very well saying, right, let's get 20,000 bottles out, th out of the door. Do we have another 20,000 bottles in three months' time and in three months' time and in three months' time? And that takes, unless you are absolutely hammering it from day one, that does take five or six years. To, to build the warehouses, you know, to build the stock in the warehouses. So that was key. Um, speaking of that, the, the logistics of that, um, there's a trend. I meant to actually ask you this earlier on, but we went in another direction, which is great. But I, now I've thought of it again, so I can have my <laughs> cake and eat it too. There's There's been a real trend, I think, and trend might actually be making it sound smaller than it is, but a movement in the industry of, of a lot of the, the more respected traditional independent bottlers to, to open distilleries. Um, you know, uh, can you share your opinion on that or, or the why of that? I mean, I, I think I, I think I kind of know why, but um, I'd love to hear. From you. Well, I'll, I'll give you mine. Definitely. Um, and Connell's probably got a different one, but no, my, mine is that, I mean, if I take that question and also a previous question, when you were saying, you know, talking about the fact that we're, we're one of many, you know, new distilleries. Um, the if you look at uh, the whole sort of profile of single malt as a category, um, it's actually quite new. I mean, one of my early, early, early mentors, and this is before I was in, even in the industry, someone who really taught me that, to enjoy whiskey, was the uh, first ever marketing director for Macallan. Um, so I think they employed him in around 1980, maybe 79. Um, and he was told to take Macallan to the world for the first time as an own bottled brand, you know, not, not independent, but Macallan itself. And he was allowed to pretty much choose a market. He chose Taiwan and he was given a budget for the year to spend in Taiwan, which was 500 pounds um, back in 1980. That just shows where, where it's come. It remained, I think, the number one selling whiskey by volume in Taiwan until quite recently when one of the the singletons overtook it so um that's how new single malt is it it took a big kick sort of mid 2000s if you like 2005 2006 really started lifting we saw it in the independent um bottling market with a with a slight uh, drop in supply so most of these new new distilleries 90 percent, maybe 85 90 percent, are being built to make their own whiskey as a single malt to sell to make and sell their own whiskey and before single malt, 
no one did that. I mean, the, the distilleries were being built to make a volume of uh, whiskey to then trade or sell to the uh, brokers and blenders to make into blends. So even though you were making whiskey, you weren't, you didn't have a hand in the success of the final product. Mm. And if blends were successful, you kept on making it. And if they weren't, then you had a problem. But with single malt, you are the commander and, and chief, basically. You you get to cook it and 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 um, eat it, well, sell it for eating. Uh, so it's up to you to make a good job. Um, and I think that's what's really exciting about the new wave. Yeah, that, that, it's very interesting because the, as the dynamics change, the sort of creative emphasis, well, I don't know which is the chicken and which is the egg in that. <laughs> you know, it's, <laughs> it, the, it, you know, the lack of readily available casks oh. has created one or the other you know i don't i'm not sure which one i you know um i, I guess they sort of feed off of one another you know the, the as distilleries a lot of the new ones stand on their own or have to stand on their own they they, they can't expect to have that but they also at the same time they also can't uh veer too far away from what's expected of them i don't know i've sort of lost my thread on that one <laughs> no I, I think i think i think i know where you're going I, like yes um as a delphi you know the the we're not we're not getting off of the same casks that we were offered maybe maybe even only i don't know what we're we in maybe 12 to 15 years ago you know i mean it's it, it has the, the industry has definitely tightened and you know but we're, what we're going to see is uh, there was a heap of you know we'll see some 2000 stuff coming in but you know in regards to 70s 80s now 90s whiskey now is it's, it's not what you know what we used to be able to achieve or what to buy if you like and um Forget trying to buy a cask these days um, if you want to get a sample. I mean that that that's almost laughable. Um, but uh, look, you know, Adelphi wise, we will continue as as long as we have good stock um, to 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 purchase. We we will we will keep going, and we're very lucky that we've got fantastic relationships in the industry and um, that we treasure, um, and that's the only reason why we're still here. So it's it's great. So do you do you envision spending more of your working time focusing on Adelphi or or Arden Merkin, Connell, or or sort of the, a split of the two? The, the way it's working just now is it's it's a bit of a split, but it, my time's skewed just now because there's no travel involved at all. So it's it's very much a right. We've got and a batch of Arden Merkin out. Let's let's focus on single casks, and it, and it, and then it just goes again. So actually this time so in the middle of summer we're, we're now coming to a bit of a head that what are we on friday now so monday we're about to blend the next batches of arden american um, and we're just obviously we're actually going through the fi the final stages of an adelphi list so they're kind of at the same time in tangent but yeah it's it's one thing after another now and when it just used to yeah. be hunting single casks and just waiting for arden american to be ready so yeah it's busy i love it it's great um my team are fantastic and we're, we're just always on the go just now we really are so um that's that's great that's great to hear and i i only have one more question that fits perfectly with that which is you know what do you envision over the next three five years the ardner merkin sort of core lineup becoming uh are, is it going to be a series of age statements so is it going to be non-age statement stuff or both um the you know i've seen so many different business models lately you know um and speaking of Sam, like there's, you know, the, what's been going on in the last two years with with um, Glen Alecky is really interesting. Like they've clearly, mm -hmm. they went from two years ago, no one I knew in America, I'd mentioned it in liquor stores, they didn't know what I was talking about. And now they all are sold out of it all the time, you know? Yeah, um, that's that's Billy through and through. <laughs> um, I, so in terms of our American, I mean, I, I um, I'm going back to a very much earlier question tonight. I've always felt that it's about, um, uh, again, it's about the taste. So we have come in as a new distillery. We don't have any traditional age statements to follow as ourselves. Um, I completely understand people who, who can, uh, at consumer end who follow age statements because that's what they're used to and what they expect as benchmarks. But we're coming in from a flavor aspect. And the way I see Arden American progressing as a core range not, not the, the single cast and the limiteds, but the, the core range, like the one we're about to, to put together again on Monday, is that um, when we get to a an age 
area and it may be eight years down the line it may be 10 years down the line we just don't know yet where we see the core flavor radically changing uh, into another you know that that's sort a of caterpillar butterfly style um then yes we may add in another core statement and and call it something else it's too early to say but we're not going to fix ourselves on having an eight-year-old a 12-year-old a 15-year-old and so on it will be purely down to what the casks tell us to do when we get to that stage Mm -hmm. And one of the things I've been very, very careful to do, again, as a new distiller, is yes, we want to fill as much uh, first fill high quality casks as we can from an early day in order to get things maturing. But we've also got to keep an eye, we've got to get that refill stock coming through too, because otherwise it's going to take even longer to get to an older age statement because everything will be maturing too quickly. So we've made sure that we've had at least 15% every year of refill casks filled at the distillery. And now that we're actually bottling things, we put those casks back in as well. So that becomes our refill stock um, every year. And, and I think that's key. You, you've got to be patient. It's like planting a tree. You know, it may not be your lifetime or your stewardship, uh, but you've got to be patient with, with Scotch. Um, uh, that's that's really interesting, uh, thinking about the sort of the purposely slowing the maturation down. I hadn't, I hadn't thought about it in those terms, but you know, um, I get that. Yeah, that's. Hmm. I think I think you've talked about the age there, Alex. But what I will say is that you know we have been, we've really found our our go to battle um, from Kentucky, which we're really happy with, um, and we're, we've got our our couple of um, bodegas in in Hereth that we're really happy with. Um, but what we have started looking at off late is, is is other vessels that we can mature out in the market in, and also other um, uh, peated. Uh, fennels that we're looking at as well so we're actually for the first time um, next month actually we're going to be doing a heavily peated run of of our American barley um, which will be 88 parts per million and we're also um, looking at other casks so we've we filled into some port casks some rum casks um, Madeira Sautern and you know we're looking at other things in, in the future as well so there, there will be other little bits and pieces along the way um, but in regards to a core range if you like it's it will be when it's ready to be uh, that we're not going to force force our hand to do it um yeah. it'll, it'll be it'll be exactly the same approach as what we took when, when, when we decided to bottle our first um we have a question here from mark pruitt is it harder to please the palate of the american consumer oh <laughs> uh, well, we, well, well we don't we don't know yet <laughs> can, we you, can we tell you in two weeks <laughs> I think no, actually, honestly, Greg, there there are definitely and um, different palettes around the world. Different markets have different palettes, um, but it changes. I mean, I always, if I take one example, I always assumed Sweden uh, loved big, not big, but but properly peated whiskies. You know that kind of Isla style. But in a tasting we did quite recently in Sweden. Uh, and it was very much the same kind of audience as, as before. I would say 80, 85% of the room preferred sherry that night, the sherry style. So, mm. diff you know, things do change over time. Um, I think I America's quite, quite wide in terms of its flavor profile, what they like. For sure, yeah. And I, I can't tell you how many people who would have told you up front that they were straight bourbon people that I have given 15 year old Glen Allocky to and just completely rocked their world. And it, it couldn't be further away from what they were expecting, you know, and they love yeah. it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it, and it's, you know, the, I know that the, the biggest opportunity in the U S is also the biggest pain, which is it's basically 50 countries from a logistics standpoint, yeah. you know, and, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's been tough for us in a number of ways too, because we were doing tastings and stuff that, you know, we could do them here and we couldn't do them here. And, where I come from in Pennsylvania is the worst in the country. So this, <laughs> that's why I'm not there. That's not, that's not why I'm not there. Um, but uh, anyway, um, I, I really uh, appreciate you guys' time. Uh, it was wonderful talking to you. Um, I was I was personally, as a whiskey nerd, very excited to talk to you because, like I said, I've been listening to your interviews and just reading stuff, and I'm very excited. And I'm, I'm going to go to – I'm going to be in the Bay Area in two weeks, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to go hit up Sam if he has your whiskey in stock yet. <laughs> 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 well, look, we, we we really appreciate you having us but we honestly can't wait to be there physically um and actually you know 
be able to to talk about Arden American on the ground. Um, as I say, we've got great friends over there, uh, lots of open invitations, which we're <laughs> very tempted to take as soon as possible. So, um, yeah, can't wait. Well, hopefully you won't come here while I'm there because I'm the same way <laughs> going back there because I want to keep going on this independent bottling film and, and I, you know, I got to get back there and finish it up. And I think I can finish it up in four days, but I got to get there first. So, Great. Well, yeah, hopefully, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll see each other in the flesh in the not too distant future. Any uh, updates on the football before we go? Oh no, it was it, it finished the draw, but you know, um, from a quite, from a, 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 a typical a typical Scottish um, uh, sort of view, it's it's a win to be honest uh, for, for me. <laughs> I think we actually played quite well and didn't throw it away at the end, so uh, quite quite happy, quite happy. They, when I was talking, I said I was talking to our producer Linda earlier, and she said I missed the national anthem, and that's my favorite part because we can't lose that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But uh, <laughs> on that note, uh, thank you guys. Thank you so much. Um, I can't wait to get loads and loads of your whiskey here. And I know lots of other people can as well. So um, Brilliant. thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Thanks Greg. Great to see you. Bye. Have a good Take weekend. Cheers. All the best. Ta-da.